Good morning. Uh, good to see you all. Good to be with you. Uh, for those viewing online, welcome once again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Michael Carlson. I'm the lead pastor here at Park Church. And as always, it's great to be with you. Um, I, this past week, at least since Wednesday, I have officially been a bachelor uh, because I dropped my wife and my kids off at the airport early Wednesday morning there in Waco, Texas, where I'll be joining them on uh, this Wednesday. And uh, I've just been reminded <laughs> this past week how painfully dependent I am <laughs> on, on especially my wife. She's like the skeletal structure of my life. She's the anchor. I mean, I'm watching these days go by and like basic things like dishes pile in the sink or like <laughs> me stepping over clothes that should be in the hamper. And, and even as I'm saying this, I'm realizing she may be watching <laughs> right now. If, uh, sweetheart, the house is super clean. If I'm just, uh, yeah. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing them this, this Wednesday. Um, and I, I was reminded recently of a conversation that I had with my uh, youngest child, my son, Daniel, probably like, I think four, four weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. And I was putting him to bed and uh, unsuccessfully trying to get him to fall asleep. And I forget how, but the topic of death came up. And, and Daniel, just innocently, as he was reflecting on death and what it is, he, he said, so is, like, are grandma and grandpa going to die? And, and I said, well... One day, and then he thought, he said, is, like, are you and Moa, his mom, are you and mom going to die? Well, yeah, but probably not, probably not for a, a long time. And he's like, and, and Esther? And, yeah, but probably not for a really long time. And, and then he was quiet. And, and he looked at me and he said, Dad, am I going to die? Like, what does a parent say in a moment like that? I mean, I can tell you everything I wanted to say, the, the obligatory parental response that comes from this place of love and comfort is, is do you know what? Don't think about that. Like, you, you don't have to worry about that for a long, long time, buddy, okay? And that's probably a good and appropriate thing to say, but that, that raises the question of, like, when... When should we start thinking about it? At what point do we stop dismissing death and start actually pondering, thinking about, considering? See, what, what Daniel articulated that evening in his own way is a question that haunts every single one of us. Philosopher Irvin Yalone put it this way, we are forever shadowed by the knowledge that we will grow, blossom, and inevitably diminish and die. Author Dorana Durgan said this, don't be afraid of anything, only fear death. CEO and entrepreneur Naval Ravikant said this, all fears are children of the fear of death. And our pal Woody Allen said this, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Whether or not you've ever articulated it, we all as human beings are haunted by the inevitability of death. Whether it's the death of a loved one or one's own, it is the fear that lies behind every other fear This morning, uh, we are finishing a series called Unchained, uh, a series where we've been exploring the theme of freedom and, and what it means to follow Jesus toward the life of freedom we were created for. And we, we began by contrasting two different ideas of what freedom is, and we explored how, how freedom is not simply doing whatever it is we want to do, but it's actually following God's way 
and doing what he wants. And we talked about freedom and money and how money, the stuff that we have, our resources, while a good gift makes for a terrible master. And if we serve money, we will find ourselves enslaved to something that that binds us more and more and more. We also talked about last week freedom and truth, and how when we look at Jesus, we see the truth that ultimately sets us free from the lies that bind us. Well, we're ending this series today by talking about something that, that binds us, perhaps maybe for some more than anything else. We are talking about the fear of death. And in response to this basic human fear that, again, lies behind all fears, what I want to suggest that we explore today is the fact that at the center of Christianity lies a story that offers good news. I want to direct our attention to some words from the New Testament book of Hebrews today. Uh, Hebrews was a letter written by a Christian in the mid to late first century A.D., written to Jewish Christians. And these Jewish Christians at this time were experiencing some level of persecution. And they were very tempted to abandon the church, to stop following Jesus, and to go back to the synagogue where it was more comfortable for them. And and the author of Hebrews is writing and basically making the argument that whatever it is you're tempted to go back to, Jesus is better. He describes Jesus as the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. The author of Hebrews then goes on to begin making this argument that Jesus is greater than the angels. So you have human beings, you have angels, and then you have the creator and Jesus. And so this is the context in which the author of Hebrews is writing when these words are written. Now, real quick, when you hear the the phrase children, think just human beings in general, okay? And so this, this is what the author of Hebrews has to say, and I invite us to listen. This is God's word. Since the children have flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. God's word. Pray with me. Gracious God, uh, we pause now, and first of all, we thank you for the gift of the scriptures. We, we believe that you not only inspired these words so long ago, but that you have preserved them through your spirit for the sake of your church and for the sake of your world. I invite now the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts, open our minds. Don't let us leave this morning unchanged. Uh, We love you because you first loved us and we pray in your son's name, Father, and we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Fear of death is a powerful force, isn't it? It's interesting that in these few words, uh, the author makes some rather sweeping claims about reality, including reality when it comes to death. He, he claims that, that death, more specifically fear of death, is something that's, like a, that's almost like a weapon that is used to hold humanity captive, that we are in some way enslaved to this fear of death. And the author here also explains, describes who it is that wields this weapon, that wields this force. The one who holds the power of death. And he describes him in the same way Jesus does 
as simply the devil. And, and so the, the sort of worldview that the author here is, is working within and, and commending as true is that reality, the reality in which we live is one in which there's this hierarchy of evil. And at the top of that hierarchy is one who holds a weapon, who holds a power that enslaves, in a sense, all humanity. Every single one of us are touched, are influenced by this power, this weapon, and that is the fear of death. Now, to the author of Hebrews' original recipients of this letter, uh, first century followers of Jesus, first century Christians, they would have understood this so well because they lived in a context in which they were persecuted for their faith. They knew that Rome, their oppressors, used death, fear of death, as their primary weapon. And this has been the story of humanity. Think of any major civilization, any major empire throughout the history of the world. And how did they, whoever they are, how did they amass and maintain their power? By wielding fear of death. The Romans were experts at this. They knew that if there was any sort of an uprising in their empire, if, if there was any group that got together and said, you know what, we don't like the way that you're doing things, they had it down to a science. They knew what to do. They would march into town, they would identify the leader, and then they would put that leader on the other side of their spear. And then the movement would die away. Fear of death is powerful. There's this fascinating letter. If you're a history nerd, you'll appreciate this. If not, just bear with me. There's this fascinating letter that, uh, that historians have and reference that give, shine light on the experience of early Christians in the first couple hundred centuries. Uh, and it's a letter from a, a governor of Rome, a, a governor of a particular region, um, and, and his name was Pliny, Pliny the Younger. There was a Pliny the Elder. This was Pliny the Younger. And, and he writes this letter because he's new on the job, and he's figuring out, he's trying to figure out his, his role, and, uh, and he comes across this problem. And, and it's this odd, weird group of people called Christians. And he's trying to figure out, what do I do with them? They're a little obstinate. Like, they're, they're not worshiping the emperor. That's a big no-no. That's like sin number one in the Roman Empire. What do I do with them? And he, and he doesn't know. So he writes to his boss, the emperor, Trajan. And he's like, oh, okay, hey, hi, boss. You're the man. Like, all of this. And he's like, okay, here's the problem. I, I need some guidance on this, okay? I'm new on the job. You're my boss. So, like... I found this group of people called Christians, and they don't want to worship you. What do I do? And, and he describes what he's been doing up to this point. And this is what he writes. He says, In the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. When you read interrogated, think torture. <laughs> Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. This was not an uncommon practice in the ancient Roman world. This was the reality in which Christians were living. Followers of Jesus at this time knew well the power of the fear of death. And they knew who wielded it. It was Rome. And they knew that behind the curtain of Rome was a power, a much more sinister, evil power that holds this power of death, not just over them, but over all humanity. The power of the fear of death is pervasive. Now, clearly, you and I today live in a place that's a bit removed from the experience from first century Christians, right? We don't live in first century Roman Empire, although I will say that we have many brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world whose circumstances are probably more similar 
to theirs than ours is. And yet, that's not our immediate context. That's not the space in which we live now. We don't live in an oppressive regime that is using death as a means to gain our compliance. However, that doesn't mean that the fear of death is not a powerful force in our lives today. And so let me, let me ask a question. This is not rhetorical. I like getting responses. Where do you see the fear of death in our culture today? What do you think? Advertisements. Yeah. Marketing and advertising, depending on the product, they know what buttons to push in order to get us to buy their product. Absolutely. What else? I was thinking racism, just the color of the skin. Okay, racism. Sure. Yeah. Healthcare. Healthcare? Yeah. I mean, I think of just the, the pandemic. Just think about the pandemic and all of the disruption, all of the disorientation, all of the conflict and politicization, all of the havoc that has been wrought by COVID. And if you dig down deep, what, what's underneath all of it? Fear of death. And, and it raises the question, when we live in this world, when we live in this reality where fear of death has such a hold on us, how do we respond? What do we do? And there are several, I think, different ways we tend to respond to the fear of death. We, we can deny it. In fact, I think we're really good at denying. In fact, because of the affluence of the society in which we live, I think we can afford probably more than most to live in a state of denial. From, as Brian mentioned, uh, marketing and advertising, to, to everything that we do, the, think about all of the resources that we put into getting us to, to look and feel younger. We're in denial. We also can avoid it. We can avoid the inevitability of death by A, just never talking about it, or B, by distracting ourselves to death. Perhaps a more, I would say, healthy response to the question of what can we do in light of this power is we, we learn to cope with and even manage it. I, I read a number of articles this past week in the field of, of psychology, and there are a lot of decent resources out there on how to deal with what, what some call thanatophobia. It's an actual word for fear of death. And some of these coping mechanisms that are recommended are things like pondering your own death. Not avoiding it, but pondering it. Things like focusing on things in your life that give you a sense of meaning and purpose as a means of managing this fear of death. So some professionals even, even recommend poking fun of death, being willing to joke about it and to make light of it. And, and let me just say, compared to denial and avoidance, learning to manage and cope with the fear of death is a much healthier path. I mean, these are, these are good practices and skills, so I don't want to disparage anything there. And yet, even if we learn to cope with and manage the inevitability, the fear, and the anxiety of death, none of that changes its finality. None of that changes the fact that death is coming. But there's good news. There is good news because death comes for us all, yes. 
We can deny it. We can avoid it. We can even find ways to cope with and manage our fear of it. But in the end, we cannot defeat death. But this, this is precisely why Jesus came. Jesus came to defeat death. He came to share in our humanity so that he might break the power of the one who holds the very power of death and thus free us from the fear of death that holds us captive. What if our fear of death isn't simply a condition we need to cope with, but a power we need to be freed from? What if death isn't a problem that needs to be managed, but an enemy that needs to be defeated? Friends, this is the story of Christianity. This is the story of Jesus. That in the person of Jesus, we find a God so driven by love for a world that has run far away from him, has run straight to death. A God who says, you know what, I love you too much to let you continue to go in that direction, so I am going to come. I am going to share in your humanity. I'm going to become one of you. I'm going to experience everything you experience, even death itself. And the good news is that this God who's driven by love, who chases after us, that he has come, and that by experiencing death itself, he's actually exhausted it of its power. He's actually taken the weapon of the evil one, the one at the highest tip of the hierarchy of evil, and he said, do your worst to me. And evil did its worst to him. And then Jesus came out the other side. Jesus defeated death. And to anyone who would follow him as Lord and Savior, he gives the only thing, the only thing more powerful than the fear of death. He gives hope fueled by love. That's the only thing. That is the only thing that is more powerful than the fear of death is hope in eternal life fueled by the love of God. Once again, the early followers of Jesus knew this so well. Again, Rome knew their stuff. They knew how to control the people. The problem is, what do you do with a group of people who no longer fear death? Like every movement, when this kingdom movement that Jesus started first formed, Rome, aided in many ways by the Jewish leaders at the time, came in and they did what they do best. They found its leader, Jesus, and they killed him. And for a few days, the movement seemed to have dissipated like every other movement throughout Roman history. But then something happened three days later. And this obscure, marginal Jewish sect had a new life breathed into it. And it began to grow and grow and grow. And so Rome did what Rome continued to do best. They would go and they would find who they thought was a leader and they would kill this person. And, and yet this darn group kept growing. Why? Because the very weapon that Rome had depended upon to keep and control the people no longer worked because they were dealing with a group of people who had come to know and love and trust a God who entered into death itself and came out the other side. Death no longer had any power, which is why within three centuries, this movement of Jesus followers took over the Roman Empire. Jesus defeated death. He defeated death. And he offers to anyone who would look to him, anyone who would cling to him, anyone who would say, yes, I, I believe that you have entered into death, that you've taken on yourself the consequences of my sin, of my guilt, and you've exhausted those consequences of its power over my life. Why? Because you love me. Anyone who would look to Jesus and just cling to him and follow him 
could exchange the fear of death for a hope fueled by love. Jesus defeated death. And when you see this embodied in a community, it is so powerful. I, uh, I had the privilege uh, one month ago to be standing right here uh, on a Sunday afternoon speaking at uh, a celebration of life service. Um, many, many of you know uh, that, that about a month and a half ago we we lost here in our community a dear sister in Christ, Tanya Lizitsky. She had been battling cancer for a very, very long time. Uh, and, and I remember I'm Clem. Clem's here this morning. I, Clem and I, we had a lot of conversations around that time and since. I was just having breakfast with him this past week. Uh, and, and so many of our conversations were this have been filled with this, this combination of grief and yet at the same time, hope. And, and, and it's, it's not that Clem is not mourning. He's mourning deeply as you should be, brother. And yet, as the scriptures say, he is not mourning as one who is without hope. For, for those of you who were here during that celebration of life service, it was... It was powerful. Jennifer, you sang at it. It was incredible to, to sit and to listen to story after story after story of this woman, Tanya, and her life, and, and to watch people who knew her and came around her. I mean, the Red Bank community group is incredible, the way that they have surrounded Clem and Maria during this time. Like, how do you explain that? Like, how do you explain an environment like that service where there is grief, deep mourning, real lamenting? And, and yet at the same time, I don't know how else to explain it, but there's a spirit of joy. How do you explain that? Uh, a couple weeks before Tanya passed away, I had the privilege of sitting next to her bed in the hospital, talking with her. And, and all I can say is, while she may have been afraid of dying, who isn't to some degree, like what, what blew me away was this deep sense of peace that just emanated from her. She had this crystal clear sense of focus because she wanted everyone around her, everyone around her, to know the hope fueled by love that she knew. Like, there was a nurse that cared for her that came and spoke at the Celebration of Life service. How do you explain that? You explain it because Jesus defeated death, that he came, that he shared in our humanity, and that through his death, he broke the power of the one who holds the power of death, and he offers to any who would turn to him, he offers an exchange of the fear of death for the hope that only he can offer, fueled by love. So there I was, and I'll end with this. There I was at Daniel's bedside, watching him after having just asked this question, am I going to die? Watching him think. And, and of course I said, yeah, but you don't have to think about that for a long time, buddy. Like, I can't, I'm a parent, I can't not just be. <laughs> but, but then I said, well, bud, you know what? You know, you remember the story of Jesus, right? He's like, yeah. I was like, did, did Jesus die? He's like, yeah, he died on the cross. I'm like, that's right, buddy. What happened after he died? He said, well, he, he rose from the dead. And I was like, that's right. And buddy, here's, here's what's so cool. If you're friends with Jesus, like if you love Jesus, then in the same way that God rose Jesus from the dead, he's going to raise you from the dead one day too. Like death does not have to be the end of your story, buddy. Isn't that so cool? Isn't that beautiful? 
And like, as, as I'm telling him this, there's, there's a part of me in my brain that is like, that is like realizing that what I'm saying is not simply soothing words for a young child, however important it is to do that. Like, these words are actually true. Do you believe that? Jesus came and he defeated death. And he offers to everyone, anyone who would turn to him, in exchange for fear of death, a hope fueled by love. May we be, brothers and sisters, friends, may we be a church family that is filled with a hope that is fueled by love. Pray with me. Father, you are the source of life. We believe this. And though we all in our own ways have, have run away at different times from you, from the very source of life, we've all run toward death. We are humbled and grateful that you are a God who, who has run after us who chases us, who pursues us. And you don't just run and, and grab us and pull us back to life, but you go out ahead of us. And you, you've gone out ahead of us. And through your son, Jesus, you have taken death upon yourself. You have taken the worst that evil has to offer. And you've come out the other side. And you offer now to everyone, because of your love, a hope that could never spoil or fade a hope that is eternal, a hope that is real and true and more powerful than the fear of death that enslaves this world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, we, we love you too. And we pray today in the name of your son, Jesus, who gave everything for us on the cross. And we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit who fills us with hope and cultivates our hearts in love. Amen.